What if I told you that the fastest growing sport in America isn't basketball, football, or baseball? Do I have your attention? Probably so. Welcome everyone to Buy, Hold, Sell, and Crosscheck Media special report on the sport of lacrosse. And I have a very special guest with me today from ESPN, Chris Cotter. Chris, welcome to the show. And good to see you again, Todd. Our, our old days back at the Fox Business Network, kind of a little reunion here. No doubt about it. And I got to tell you, I was looking up some old clips on YouTube. We were on TV dozens of times. I can't believe it. And it was so it's such great memories. I, I mean, I, I, it, we'll be on here forever. We get really get into it. But I have to ask you, though, you bring up Fox. You went from Fox Business talking about stocks and bonds and investments and Wall Street and then you transfer over to ESPN. I mean, usually everybody leaves Fox to go to CNBC or Bloomberg. <laughs> you went the complete opposite direction. How did that happen? Well, keep in mind, I was doing uh, sports talk radio for years in Atlanta. And then I was with the Mets Network in New York City before I was ever at Fox Business. You know, I went from the Mets Network, which was literally two buildings up Sixth Avenue from the Fox Business Network, and just walked down the street and started working at Fox for those years that I was there. So that was sort of the, I was somewhat of an interloper, I guess, at Fox in between my stints in sports radio and sports TV. Okay, that makes a lot of sense then. So, and I obviously you have the background in lacrosse, I mean, in your college days. Yeah. I did. Yeah. I played growing up all through high school in Colorado. I played for my club team at Georgia Tech. So that's kind of how I got into it. And then being in Atlanta back in even 20 years ago in Atlanta, there was, really wasn't any high school or youth lacrosse. I mean, I think when I left Atlanta to come to New York in 2005, there were six high schools, all pro the big private schools in Atlanta that were playing lacrosse. And now there are over 100 uh, public schools and private schools playing the game here in the States. That's how much it's grown in some of the outlier states. Yeah, you're right about that, because it used to just be an East Coast sport. Oh, it has yeah. truly migrated coast to coast, but not just here in the, in the United States. It's also in the UK. It's growing quite rapidly. And, and I'd imagine elsewhere um, in other countries. And plus, there's also a discussion about including this as an international sport, perhaps in the Olympics one day. But that's a discussion for another time. But yeah, you're right. Down in Atlanta, I mean, there's some great club teams down there right now. A lot of D1 athletes are being produced out of the southeastern uh, part of the country for a sport that was primarily a northeast sport. So that's uh, that's wonderful news. So let me ask you. So in the sport of lacrosse, you know, we because you do have the background with Fox, so you have your MBA, so clearly you know all about business. One thing I always remember when I was working on Wall Street is how many people actually played the sport of lacrosse and ended up landing in on Wall Street. It was crazy. I yeah. mean, what are, your, what are your thoughts? I mean, why is that? Why is that the case? Well, think about this. I mentioned I moved up to New York in 2005 from Atlanta. And I was playing in an old man's league in Atlanta at the time. I moved to New York and I say, uh, so I, I can go to Chelsea Piers and play in some adult leagues down there. That's great. I'm going to do that. Brought my stick down to Chelsea Piers one day and these guys were all Wall Street guys from Princeton, Cornell, Duke. They had just graduated. And I was like, I'm tired from, you know, walking from the subway station down here to Chelsea Piers. I'm not going <laughs> to run up and down the field with you guys. They were all like 28 years old, D1 players, all working on Wall Street. So I think a lot of it is just the schools that are the top schools in lacrosse. Todd. When you think about, I mentioned some of them in all the Ivy League schools in Virginia and even Rutgers. Great lacrosse program at Rutgers, and that's what their head coach, Brian Brecht, sells all the time. He says, come here. We're right around the corner from Wall Street. You can do your summer internships in New York, and it'll work out great for you. That's a big recruiting point for him. And so all of these schools that would normally feed these, these uh, you know, bright young traders and whatnot to Wall Street, well, the lacrosse players are no different. They're good students, too. And they're not going to school to play professional lacrosse. That is an option, but it isn't really a long-term option for them. It isn't something that, you know, I'm not going to Duke because I want to ready myself for professional lacrosse. I'm going to Duke because I want to work on Wall Street someday, and I'm going to play lacrosse while I'm there. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. I would tell my kids that all the time. Use the lacrosse stick as an extra tool 
to get into the school of your choice. Don't think of it as a, you're going to be playing professionally. Use it as that, yeah. in that great networking community that the sport brings along. I know in Notre Dame, they actually spend a, they actually spend a few weeks working in Manhattan for firms like JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs. That's actually required that if you're going to play there, yeah, you're going to be interning elsewhere, usually in the financial sector. And, and it's just a feeder right into Wall Street. Plus, let's be honest here, too. You have people that the, the lacrosse player on the field, people are yelling at each other. There's discipline that's involved. The amount of hard work that a college player goes, they have to practice five days a week in the fall, six days a week in the spring. There's a lot to it. You work on Wall Street, you're going to be expected to put in some time. Yeah, there's certainly there's a huge leadership component to it. And a lot of to, to your point about why kids go to these schools, you know, you're not you're not making the NIL money. You're not, uh, you know, the, the king of the hill at Alabama or LSU in football or even in Notre Dame. You're working your tail off to get through school, to be a captain on the lacrosse team. All those things, you know, you're 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 doing all those things that are going to make you successful in, on Wall Street day to day when you're 19, 20, 21 years old, you're not leaving early to go to the pros. You're there for the long haul. A lot of these kids too are in COVID fed into this because it gave them an extra year of eligibility. A lot of these kids are graduate students. And interestingly yeah. enough, you have a kid like the Kai Montgomery who was playing at Duke, got an extra year of eligibility, but graduated as an undergrad. He was trying to get into the Fuqua school of business it's hard to get into that school and they're not just giving anybody, you know, a ticket to get yeah. in. He had to work his way in just like everybody else had to work their way in. And it was a big celebratory moment down there at Duke when he got in. Cause now not only is he going to go to Fuqua and get his MBA, but he gets another year of lacrosse eligibility to go along with. It. Yeah, that's huge. And then you, you think about that defenseman that left UNC Bowen, who's now at Georgetown. You know, similar situation. So, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, so. he, and it was like they didn't have the graduate degree that he wanted in North Carolina, and they did at Georgetown. So he got the blessing of Coach Bresci as North Carolina head coach. I mean, talk about a smart kid graduating in three years at North Carolina, and he still has – I think he had three years of eligibility left when he stepped foot on campus at Georgetown. Yeah, yeah, and a hell of a player too. So, great uh, player. That's, uh, yeah, great player, no doubt about that. So let's talk about that a little bit. So right now, currently, I mean, it just seems like a lot of these teams are just really competitive. I mean, watching the Duke high point game the other day, Duke just looks unstoppable. But then you also have Maryland and UVA, Notre Dame, Syracuse is looking yeah. good. I mean, all the blue bloods that are out there and there's so many good teams. Do you have any teams right now? I mean, I'm sure in your analysis, you guys are going to be doing 265 games for the women and the men's. So much lacrosse this year. It's going to be fantastic and outstanding to watch. But as a fan, I'm just curious. Do you have maybe a Final Four already in mind? Well, you know, Quinn Kesnick and I, uh, one of the analysts for ESPN, all, all lacrosse fans know him as an All-American at Hopkins is, and has really been the face of television lacrosse for the last 30 years. He and I just had this conversation. And I said, I really think when I look at my rankings, uh, it's top-heavy. I mean, I think Maryland and Virginia – are two teams that stand out. Georgetown is kind of alone at number three. And then there's a big group that includes a lot of Ivy League schools, Cornell. I mean, Cornell played for the championship last year. Yeah. They're bringing just about everybody back. Yale's going to be good. Princeton's going to be good. Notre Dame out of the ACC is going to be good. So then there's that group. Quinn was kind of like, he didn't see it as top heavy. He thought that that group was big enough to include not just Maryland and Virginia at the top, but also those other schools I mentioned. Ohio State's going to be very much improved yeah. playing in their new facility, which is unbelievable in Columbus. So that's yeah. going to give them added motivation. So I think that he really feels like there's eight, nine, ten teams that could go to championship weekend and win a national title. I still think it's top heavy. I think it's Maryland and Virginia. And then maybe Georgetown is that third team and then a, a few others that could spoil the party. But I still like those top teams. Yeah. And we'll talk about that coming up because that Maryland Virginia game is a rematch from last year, which everybody was a one, two matchup. Everyone was looking forward to Maryland. They get the better of UVA. It could be different this time uh, this year, but we'll, we will talk about that. So listen, let's keep it there. We're going to, we're going to go to a break right now, Chris. I do want you to stick around. Let's talk about the schedule, go into a couple of other things regarding the sport and, um, and we'll, we'll have some fun with it. So okay. thanks a lot for being with us and we'll be right back after the break. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Veronica Dudo, and welcome to Buy, Hold, Sell. If you have the Russians that are going into Ukraine, the Americans and the Germans and everyone else in Europe is going to say, hell no. If Russia doing things, you know, logically was their M.O., I'd agree with you. Yeah, Todd, why don't you get him on, on a phone call right now? Hello, you... <laughs> Financial News TV, just the way you like it. Fast paced, unadulterated, in your face, rock and roll style. Join us next time on Buy, Hold, Sell Live. Oh, yeah, I'm going to remember all that. I can't even remember. Oh, God. Yeah, well, that doesn't. I want you to. Uh, oh, my God. Fast pace, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Take one. Fast paced, no holds barred, in your face, rock and roll style. Woohoo! Good sign. Let's kick some ass. Welcome back, everyone, to Buy, Hold, Sell, and Cross Check Media Special Report on the Sport of Lacrosse. And I do have ESPN's Chris Cotter with me today. And Chris, one thing I wanted to ask you if you were a senior, a high school senior now, Let's fast forward. You're the big lacrosse stud. You're out in Colorado. You know you're going to be playing college lacrosse. Which coach would you want to play for? Mm, man, that is such a good question because I have so many that I really like that I'd love to play for. Um, see, I really like – now, see, the guys that I really like, I'm not sure the guys that I really want to play for, even though they're great coaches. <laughs> but, like, Joe Bresci in North Carolina, I've gotten to be pretty close with him. Kevin Warren at Georgetown as well. Mm -hmm. Fun guys. Um, but then again, you know, you look at like uh, a guy like Nick Myers at Ohio state he just has success, yeah. you know, like guys want to play for him and they love playing for him. Yeah. Um, his assistant coaches love coaching with him. He's had the same guys forever. So you, it would be hard pressed not to want to play for a guy like that. And then there's the school issues. I mean, if I visited Princeton and I got an offer to go uh -huh. to school at Princeton, it would be tough to walk around that campus and say, no, it's, you know, this isn't for me. I think, I, it is. I think it is. I think it is for you. <laughs> Duke's no, the same right. way. So gorgeous. Like if I walked on Duke's campus and walked around, weather's beautiful all year round. You know, you're playing games in February and it's warm. That'd be tough to say no to a place like that. Yeah, you're right about that. Because, I mean, the, the coaches, and they're all good. You, they're all at the top of yeah. their game. They're all excellent. They're, they're these cheerleaders for the team. They clearly they're looking at these kids are taking them from making them boys to men. I mean, there's so many great things. I remember Coach Donowski, he was at LaxCon a few years ago, and he came out in a speech and said that he the locker room is the best place for the lacrosse team because there's so much going on. The, the, just that joint community of brotherhood, and that's something that I'm sure other sports have, but just something about it with lacrosse, like, you know, having this yeah. contact sport, everybody's together. And he and just you know, Todd, loves that. Something else about it too, that when you think about a lot of the current pros, guys that play in the PLL, so late twenties, maybe early thirties, they're assistant coaches on a lot of these college teams. Um, and so you get coaching by guys that are pretty close to your age. And yeah. so I think that's kind of cool too, in that, they see the next step. They see a guy who's playing for Team USA in the world or is going to be an Olympian now, or they see a guy who's playing in the PLL at the highest level. Even some of the greats of all time, like some of the Brody Merrill's a coach, a high school coach who's been a high school coach now for years, one of the great defensemen of all time. So you get these young people who are close to you, can even go out there and run with you on the field if they wanted to. Yeah. And they're coaching you and you can understand, hey, if I want to be one of the greatest of all time, all I got to do is watch this guy and follow his lead. That's that's sprinkled all over college lacrosse. Great young assistants that are even many of them still playing. Absolutely. And actually, my son, he plays for a team in New York. Sweet Lax is one of the, the more elite club teams in the country. And a lot of the players that they've turned out, they've turned into be college players come back. They help yeah. out the younger kids. And that's the best part about the sport, that give back. You know, you, you almost are expected as an ambassador of the sport to give back to that next generation because, and that's what's making it grow. And I opened the show talking about the growth of the sport. The NCAA came out with that statistic saying in the last 15 years, because of the growth internationally of the sport, just domestically, college across, there's so much money going to the sport right now because it is the fastest yeah. growing sport in America. And, uh, and that's really special. 
So let's talk about the college season coming up. You guys are just blockbusters. You guys are going to be everywhere. I don't know how you have so many cameras, Chris. I don't know. <laughs> but you have the, and you have the A team. It's the same group that's together. And, yeah. and you guys are going to be doing all these great, great, uh, great games. So uh, next week, you got Duke and Denver yeah. Friday night. Will you be at that game? No. You know, I'll, a lot of these early games, we're going to be calling them from our home offices. So I'll be okay. here, but I will be calling that game with Quinn Kesnick. And that's one of those early season games. If, I feel like we've had more of those over the last couple of years. Since we had to take the COVID break, I feel like in February, our schedules have gotten much better. We've gotten more slots, like because of the ACC network, that's opened up a few more slots for us to put games. So, you know, you think this weekend, I got Georgetown and Hopkins on Saturday. And then okay. immediately after that, it's Michigan and Virginia. So this is the second week of February, and we're already getting those games. You mentioned that game a week from Friday. That's going to be Denver and Duke. That's a huge early season game to get a gauge on how these teams are going to play the rest of the year. And I'm, I love it. it. The fact that we're getting these time slots early in the year is great because ESPN has such a commitment to college basketball, both men's and women's. This just mm -hmm. shows that they're making a commitment to bring lacrosse in when they can. ESPN Plus has been a huge boon for lacrosse because it gives us a way to put all of these games on and it allows lacrosse fans a place to find them. We can't take the spot of a Big Ten basketball game on a February Saturday afternoon, but we can put that game on ESPN Plus. And if you're a lacrosse fan, you can stream it on your TV just as if it was going to be on ESPN. Yeah, you're right about that. And you're talking about the ACC network having that – as part of the part of the package. And that is a you have two critical games actually. There's on March 18th, Maryland, Virginia. We talked about that in the last box block. And then two weeks later, Duke's playing at UVA. I mean, yeah. that's a potential one, two, one, three, one, whatever it is. I mean, we'll, we'll have to see what happens, how it plays out. But just the best games that are out there right now. And that and that's only in March. I mean, we're not even talking about conference, <laughs> we're not even a conference in April. Yet. I know that, exactly. I love the so. fact that that will get so many good non-conference games that these teams will play each other. You know, I think that's another part of it too. They're all, they're all playing all comers. They understand that it's about getting the RPI up and getting these big wins. And in order to get these big wins, they got to play the team. So Maryland's playing everybody. Virginia's playing everybody. We'll see Georgetown plays everybody. They, it, they want to get these games under their belts. And the other thing that's cool too is, and we've done it for a lot of years not only do we have, we have a special deal with Hopkins. So we're, we'll play just about every Hopkins game. And that gives us an opportunity to play those games in the big 10 and to see the big 10, but also the Ivy league's resurgence. Remember oh, the COVID year, the Ivy league was having the year yeah. of their lives. And then mm -hmm. it all got cut short with COVID. They didn't yes. play the next year. And then last year they came back out. And it was like, they never left off. Right. They just picked yeah. right up. And to me, that's, that's great because you have the ACC and the big 10, and you, you always kind of look, is it going to be the Colonial? Is it going to be the Patriot League? Is it going to be the Big East? Well, it's the Ivy League. And the Ivy League has five teams in the top 15 in the country. And every week they're going to have an absolute barn burner. And we have the opportunity to put those games on. Whereas you would never expect to be able to flip on ESPN and get Penn versus Princeton. But you're going to be able to see those games on ESPN+. Plus, and we're going to have cameras there. Yeah, that's awesome. And you are absolutely right. Of the seven, seven of the eight Ivies have lacrosse right now, and all of them are ranked except for Dartmouth. And you look at how, how the competition at that level, it was big last year. It's only going to get bigger this year. And the Ivy League tournament this year returns to Columbia. I mean, that is Love the best. And Columbia doesn't have lacrosse yet. They're hosting the Ivy League lacrosse tournament this year. It's just a great atmosphere. I completely agree with you. I loved it when that tournament was there a couple of years ago. I think 2019 was the last year they had it there. Uh, and that worked out great for us, too, because we could go call that tournament. And then uh, the selection show was right afterward on Sunday night. Yeah. We could just drive up to Bristol and get in studio and have the selection show that Sunday night, which will involve a lot of these Ivy League teams. So that's going to be fun again this year to be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait. I mean, there's just so much great lacrosse. And you you are right when you look at 
some of the teams not from those those power conference schools. St. Joseph's did great. Delaware is going to be looking good. Yes. I mean, Jacksonville is another team. High Point. High Point should be doing well this year. There's so many good programs that are out there right now that aren't part of those bigger conferences. And it doesn't matter. Everybody's got a shot this year. So it's going to be exciting. Now, on the women's side, now, women's lacrosse, you guys are, are really looking at, uh, you guys are televising, I think, a record number of women's we games are. this year. What's interesting about the women's side is what I saw in uh, in the uh, US, uh, USA Lacrosse Magazine. They posted the top 20. You have two teams that are in the top 15, Southern Cal and Stanford. Yeah. You talk about a sport that's going west and staying west. And now, I mean, it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think we're seeing that a little bit with the men's game as well with Utah and how it's really branching further out. But I love it because I think that growth is going to continue. Now, you're kind of, you, you know, the inside baseball track on all, or I should say inside lacrosse track on all this stuff. Are you? Have you heard any rumblings of any other colleges that may be introducing lacrosse? The only issue really is is money. You know, I mean, that's that's right now. There are a lot of athletic associations that are pretty tight on budgets. Like for example, you know, my alma mater is Georgia Tech, and they have a great club program. They have one of the top MCLA programs in the country. And I talked to their coach, uh, Ken Lovick, who's done a great job there for decades. Don't you want to make the jump? You know, it'd be perfect. You could be in the ACC. You could be that next, the sixth team in the conference. And it's a huge commitment. And it's a big commitment money-wise for the, for the athletic departments to be able to say, we're going to bring in a men's sport. We need to have commensurate Title IX on the women's side as well. Mm -hmm. So it's just a commitment that right now, I think, unfortunately, a lot of these athletic departments are strapped for cash. Uh, Football rules the roost and everybody else is kind of trying to figure out where they belong in that in that whole entire pantheon. So I'd like to see more of it. I'd like to see more of it out west. You know, you think about the programs that have had good, really good club programs, Colorado, Colorado State, Arizona State. You mentioned USC on the men's side also had very good programs over the years. Mm -hmm. Oregon has as well. Um, Texas A&M has had good programs. Teams in the South, South Carolina, they won two straight club championships. That's another team that you would think there would be enough interest in the student body to try and make that happen. Florida and Florida State have had good teams over the years. Mm -hmm. I just think it's a matter of is there money to be able to put toward making that leap because it's a big leap to make. Yeah, you're right about that. I had a cousin that played club lacrosse for Purdue, and he's still involved where he still is saying, look, this would be a great time because now with Maryland and Hopkins in the Big Ten, and has so much has happened with Ohio State and Michigan. Yeah, you would hope to see that that sport will grow a little bit more those in that conference. Yeah, those natural uh, conference affiliations to me. And, and, and Todd, I think Purdue is a perfect example, like Northwestern would be as well. The, the yeah. high-end academic schools, uh, I think where, you know, they're, they're good in football, they're good in basketball, sometimes really good, like Purdue is right now, um, and, and good in some of the other sports. But spring sports like baseball in the big 10 not really that big when you think about relative to the southern and, and western schools so maybe there's an opportunity there to say in the springtime let's put a little focus to lacrosse let's see if we can make it work they've made it work on the women's side northwestern has had a great program in women's lacrosse over the years you know oh, maybe yeah. that's something where the administration could say if it works on the women's side and we've seen the success maybe we can make it work on the men's side yeah, that would be great. And yeah, and, and that, and can you imagine if the SEC was involved? That'd be a whole other game changer. Whole, so. uh, you, again, the SEC would be like the, the billions of dollars in football are going to stay in football. You guys deal with the nickels and dimes in your non revenue sports some, somewhere else. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, well, we're going to leave it there. So, Chris, I'm going to wish you and the rest of the team there at ESPN good luck this year. It's going to be fantastic. I know everybody's going to be watching. I know it. I know in my household, my boys and I will be watching all the games. So, we definitely can't wait. So, thanks again for joining us. And I just want to thank everybody else for tuning in today for a Cross Check Media special report on the Sport of Lacrosse. Chris, you take care. We'll see you on TV. All right, Todd. Take care. All right. Buy, hold, sell, brought to you by Crosscheck Management. Hi everyone, I'm Veronica Dudo, and welcome to Buy, Hold, Sell. If you have the Russians that are going into Ukraine, the Americans and the Germans and everyone else in Europe is gonna say, hell no. If Russia doing things, you know, logically was their MO, I'd agree with you.
Yeah, Todd, why don't you get him on, on a phone call right now? Hello? <laughs> you. Financial News TV, just the way you like it. Fast paced, unadulterated, in your face, rock and roll style. Join us next time on Buy, Hold, Sell Live. Oh, yeah, I'm going to remember all that. I can't even remember. Oh, God. Yeah, well, it does. I want you to. Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> Fast paced, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Take one. Fast paced, no holds barred, in your face, rock and roll style. Woohoo! Let's kick some ass. I want you to smash that like button. <laughs> <laughs> Track, cue, dissolve. Good morning and welcome from Big Wig Studios. From the Big Wig Media Studio. Big Wig Media's broadcast center at the Willard is the ideal headquarters to host your virtual meetings and video conferences. Kudos to our team who's running around behind the cameras. What I liked about working with Big Wig Media was you guys are the experts. Our industry pros have you covered. Let's get started.